Let's pray again. Father, we thank you for your promises. We thank you because you say where two or three are gathered. And now, Father, we ask that you speak to each one through your word as only you can. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's turn to that, those verses that were read. Or if you've memorized it, I guess you don't have to turn there. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Probably a lot of you have memorized it. I hope no matter what your age, that you have a regular program of committing Scripture to memory. There's nothing better than that. When you're somewhere where you don't have access to a Bible, you can just say Scripture. You can go on and on and on and on just saying Scripture to yourself. It's a beautiful thing. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. And Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And of course, Peter thought that was a lot, didn't he? In 22, Jesus said, I don't say to you seven, but up to 70 times seven. So Jesus went way beyond the seven. Now what is Jesus really saying there? Well, I hope nobody thinks that you're supposed to take him literally there and start your list and when they reach 490, that's it. Remember 1 Corinthians 13 in the margin talks about love does not keep account of wrongs. Now the message today is not about this, but I just want to say I'm amazed sometimes 30, 40, 50 years prior some people's memory is crystal clear about every single wrong done to them. It's, it's almost chilling when they, when they talk like that. It's not, it's, not the Holy, whoops, it's not the Holy Spirit anyway. Let's put it that way. All right, so... Uh, Jesus is saying, well, what is Jesus saying? Not, you're not supposed to count. He's basically saying, don't ever stop forgiving people. No matter how many times it is. If Jesus is asking us, to forgive that many times. What is he also saying about himself? God for, will forgive you as many times as it is necessary that you can be saved. I'm glad he's not saying, well, let me see. That's the 8,343rd time I think that's enough. I, I'm stopping now. No, he keeps forgiving. If we're asking, he's forgiving. Amen. And you know what's so amazing about him? One of the things so amazing about him? He knows when we're on our knees asking for forgiveness for something that we have done many, many times, he knows if we're going to do it again or not. And he still says, I forgive you. And it's not a game. He's not playing. It's true. He forgives us if we ask. As much as we ask for it. But you see, if we stop asking because, well, maybe we're just so embarrassed or we don't have enough faith to believe he could forgive me again or or whatever the reason and we stop asking for forgiveness 
That's when we're in trouble. You see, he's telling us if we don't give up on him, he's not going to give up on us. But if we give up and stop asking for forgiveness, for forgiveness, it's as if we have given up on him. I can't humiliate myself anymore. Or he can't possibly be that forgiving. No way. Jesus, I believe, one of the things he is saying in this Matthew 18 is if you fall, don't give up. Get up again. If you sin, don't give up. And ask again for forgiveness. Now, I think we have, one of the reasons we have such a hard time with it is we know if we wronged an individual that many times, it would be very unusual for them to still forgive us, right? And uh, what's really too bad is too many people see God as, as just a big man in the sky. He's not much better than us humans, and we are way, way off. There's a, there's a verse that talks about this. Remember the, remember the title of the sermon, Don't Give Up. It's in Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24, and I think this illustrates what I'm trying to say. Proverbs 24 and verse 16. Now I've always advocated if you're studying a particular verse and unless you you know the original languages it's a good idea if you really want to get the sense of the verse to read as many <coughs> translations of it as possible. And uh, with today's technology all technology is not bad. With today's technology you can go to places like Bible Hub, and uh, they'll give you 15 or 20 different English translations of a verse. And that's what I did here on this verse, Proverbs 24, 16. But I'm first going to read it uh, in the one I have here um, in the New King James. It says, For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again but the wicked shall fall by calamity. Now what I did here is I, I printed out from um, Bible Hub all of the different English translations of this verse. And I'm not going to read them all because it's, it's many, but I'm going to read some of them. Um, let's see. Here's one, the Good News Translation of this same verse. No matter how often honest people fall, they always get up again. But disaster destroys the wicked. Here's a, it's called God's Word translation. A righteous person may fall seven times, but he gets up again. However, in a disaster, wicked people fall. Here's one, the Good News translation. No matter how often honest people fall, they always get up again, but disaster destroys the wicked. Are you getting a sense of this? I hope you are. Let's see if I can get one more here to give you the sense of this. Um, here's one. For seven times the righteous will fall, but he will rise, but the wicked will be overthrown in calamity. I don't know if you got it or not, but I believe what God is saying here, and this is very, very important, and a lot of people miss this. There is one major difference in the saved and the lost. And the difference is the saved never, ever, give up. The lost do. They give up. The devil is always trying to get us to give up. 
isn't he? He's always, he's, he's called the accuser of the brethren. And he whispers things in our ears as we're, as we're dealing with our guilt and shame of, of knowing we have failed God again. And, and he says to them, why don't you just quit? You're carrying this burden. It's an impossibility anyway. You're just humiliating yourself. God doesn't care anymore. Why don't you just stop asking for forgiveness and just accept that's the way you are. In other words, and he probably won't use these words, but in other words, just give up. And that is a temptation sometimes, isn't it? We think, well, maybe I'll be happier if I give up. And we may even try it for a while. We're not happier. We're not better off. There's a beautiful story in the Bible about not giving up. Famous story, you know the story. It's in Genesis, the 32nd chapter. Genesis 32, and we're going to pick it up in verse 22, and it's the story, the famous story about Jacob. Genesis 32, 22. And of course, you remember the scene. He had stolen the birthright from his brother Esau. Twenty-some years had passed. He had run away and uh, married, in this case, two wives. And he had two concubines, and he had 11 sons, and he had great wealth, and he was coming back to Israel. And he heard that Esau and his band, uh, his, uh, his really army, his small army, was coming out to meet him, and he was terrified. Not so much that he himself would die, maybe even be tortured by his brother Esau, because of his anger from stealing the birthright from him. But he was, he was particularly burdened because his sin could cause the death or the suffering of his wives, his children, his servants, and on and on and on. It was his fault. It wasn't their fault. They were innocent in this. And so he was very burdened that night as he perceived that Esau and his men were getting closer, and he was defenseless. So verse 22 says, And he arose that night, and he took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Yabok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent them over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. Now, he wanted to seek God alone. He didn't want any distractions. This is my problem. I caused this problem. And only God can help me now. And although he had asked God many, many times for forgiveness and God had forgiven him, he wanted the forgiveness at this point to extend to the protection of his family. And to know that he was eternally secure with the Lord. And so he was left alone on purpose as he intended. The verse goes on, verse 24, and a man, and I hope your version capitalizes man, because we know, don't we, that this is not a man, although he appeared to be a man. A man wrestled with him. Until the breaking of the day, it was, a, I guess it was a dangerous part of the country. There was lots of thieves and, and others, and, and Jacob's on his knees, and he's on the ground, and he's, probably his eyes are closed, or at least it's fixed up in the sky. So he's talking to God, pleading, and this man taps him on the shoulder, and faking that it is just a man, but a robber, a burglar, somebody who means him harm, or maybe it's one of Esau's men, he spins around, and the two of them begin to wrestle. And they wrestle, and they wrestle, and they wrestle. Hour after hour, they're wrestling. I, I don't know if you've ever seen a wrestling match, but it's very difficult to, in fact, I would say the modern person could not do that. Our, 
our strength is so depleted we cannot do that. But anyway, they were wrestling and wrestling and wrestling. And finally, the man with the capital M, seeing how, wanting to demonstrate to Jacob how strong his faith was, wanting Jacob to grow even more, he said to him, let's see, when he saw he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. In other words, he saw that Jacob wasn't going to let go, so he says, now comes the real test to Jacob. And he touched him with his finger, and his thigh went out of joint. His hip went out of joint. Now, you and I, not that we should even think about doing this, but you could pound another human being with your fist in the thigh for as long as you wanted to, and you would never, ever take it out of joint like that. And so when this happened, Jacob knew, especially since it was just his finger, Jacob knew, this is not a man. This is God. I've been wrestling with God this whole time. He's the one I wanted to see. He's the face that I was seeking. And we know this as Jesus, don't we? This is Michael, the archangel. This is the second member of the Godhead. And, uh, of course, he knew what Jacob would do, but he wanted to test him. He said, let me go. The day is breaking. And Jacob, by now exhausted, the Son of God in no way exhausted, always full and fresh, with life, Renewed constantly in him, never diminishing. But he looks down at Jacob and he says, as if to say, as if to say, hey little boy, why don't you let me go now? And he said, clinging to his leg. You know, like your little three or four year old might do when they're, you're letting them pretend like they've actually, they're actually lifting you off the ground. So Jesus looks down at Jacob and he says, let me go. And he's grabbing onto his leg and he looks so pitiful. He could have flicked him off like a fly. He didn't have to ask for his permission. You kidding me? And Jacob, with tears, with a broken hip, exhausted from a night of wrestling, clings for all he's worth. It's not a very strong grasp compared to the Son of God, but it's all Jacob has. And in pity, he looks down at him, and Jacob says, I won't let you go until you bless me. And it's like an explosion in heaven. The faith of this man, he will not stop no matter what. That's the kind of faith that God wants. That's the kind of faith that we need. In fact, this story is so important. Now, it happened about... And I'm just doing this quick in my head, so, well, you can correct me if you want to, but it's something like 1800 B.C. So 18 and, and 2000, what is that? 38 centuries ago, and yet this story is so important that we are told it typifies the experience of God's people at the end of time, a time just ahead of us. You know, Satan is always trying to get us to quit, to give up 
we become weary. We become overwhelmed. We focus on our own strength and our failures, and we say even to ourselves sometimes, it's impossible. I can't do it. I can't go on. I can't keep trying. I'm only going to fail. And God tells us about Jacob. And he tells us that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Even if we're grabbing on to his toenail. I don't know if God has a toenail, but even if we're grabbing on, you know, with the strength of an ant compared to him, he honors that. And he blesses that. He looks for our tenacity of never wanting to give up. And so God gives us a glimpse into the future way back in Jeremiah's day. So if you could turn there with me, Jeremiah 30. Jeremiah 30, starting with verse 4. Now just a little tiny aside here. And some, sometime we'll go through a lot of these. But did you realize, I'll just make the statement and I'll let you study it out. Of all the generations that have ever lived, the Bible is most written for the last day generation. There are last day principles and insights from Genesis to Revelation. Here's one in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 30, and we're going to start with verse 4. Jeremiah 30 and verse 4. Now these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. For thus says the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Jeremiah's looking down the end of time. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. The, the, the overwhelming uh, uh, pain and... and um, responsibility and an impending uh, great event that's about to happen when a woman is in labor. God is saying that experience of all those things is happening not only to women and, and not women in labor, but women not in labor and in men. Ask now and see, verse 6, whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor and all faces turned pale? They're wrestling with God. God's people at the end of time are wrestling with it. Not, not in the same exact way that Jacob was, but spiritually wrestling with God. I won't give up, Lord. Even though the world is against me, even though my own fallen nature is against me, even though friends and family are against me, even though the powers of hell are against me, I will not give up, Lord. I'm going to cling to you. Verse 7 of Jeremiah 30. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Remember what it says in Daniel 12? A time of trouble such as never has been or ever will be. They're talking about the same moment in time, which is just ahead of us. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. Because he's stronger than the crisis? No. Because he has never sinned? No. Because he will not give, give up. He, she will not give up. I've got books in my library and I've, I've got some that I've accumulated over the years and they, they give great stories. And I, I look through them to Use one, use one every now and then in a message to help drive the message home. And I found one this week. It just fits so well. True story. 
True story. On a commuter flight, this was from Portland, Maine to Boston. So this is a commuter flight, short flight. The pilot's name was Henry Dempsey. And he heard a noise in the back of the small aircraft. And so he turned over the controls to his co-pilot and went back to check it out. When he got back to the tail section, the plane hit an air pocket and he was thrown against the back door. And it was then that he realized what the noise was. Someone had not latched the back door like they should have. And the door flew open and he was sucked right out of the plane. The co-pilot saw a red light and he knew something was wrong and he went back in that direction. He saw the open door and he radioed the nearest airport. And he was requesting permission to make an emergency landing. He said the pilot had fallen out of the plane and he requested a helicopter search that area of the ocean. Remember, they're on their way to Boston. The plane landed. And they found Henry Dempsey. <laughs> he was holding on to the outdoor ladder of the aircraft. Somehow, when he'd been blown out of the plane, he caught hold of the ladder. He held on for 10 minutes as the plane flew 200 miles an hour at 4,000 feet. And then somehow, when the plane landed, he kept his head from hitting the concrete pavement, which was only 12 inches away. You can imagine when the airport person, personnel came after a few minutes. They pried his fingers from the ladder and it took them a long, long time. But he was okay. God is telling us if you have fallen, get up. If you have sinned again, ask again for forgiveness, no matter how many times it's been. The message is very simple. Don't give up, and you will be saved. Amen. Amen. Our closing song is All the Way, number 516, All the Way.
Let's pray. Father, there may be some here or some listening later who are tempted to give up or maybe they feel they have already given up. You're still calling them, Father. You will not give up on them. It may be 490 times that they have sinned against you. It may be 4,900 times. It may be 49, 490, whatever it is. As long as we don't give up, you can save us. Father, like that man that clung to that plane with all the strength he had. Just like Jacob who clung to your leg with the little bit of strength he had left. Your promise is you will save us if we will not let go. Father, may nobody in this room, may no one listening or watching now or later let go of you. May they never ever, ever give up. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.